Cassie. Blog Talk USA. Are you tired of waiting for change? One zero one two. That gives me one thousand two hundred and fifty feet. Sounds the arrival of the flight from Los Angeles and Chicago. Hey, welcome everybody to this Monday, April 18th, 2016 edition of TNZ Talk. If you haven't done your taxes yet, well, <clears throat> you're not alone. Uh, you can include me in that. Don't uh, forget to file for your extension. Uh, we have a lot to get to today, including a guest that is going to talk about the one-year anniversary of what has been called the Baltimore Uprising. And we'll get to that guest in just a little bit. We'll talk a little, of course, presidential politics and the mayhem, the madness. And perhaps uh, there's a message in there somewhere. Hell, I don't know. Anyway, I am the T in TNZ. The Z is Richard Zombeck. He is, of course, a uh, blogger for the Huffington Post and Liberals Unite. And he joins me and you Every morning, and uh, we're getting to the point where we can actually finish each other's sentences, or maybe more appropriately, Z, interrupt each other and finish each other's sentences. Good morning. I, I was trying. I was trying not to. I didn't really. I didn't really have anything to say. I, I was still a little um, uh, taken aback uh, by your comment about my Nestle article. I'm hurt. <clears throat> And concerned. Don't, no, 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 no. I'm sending you a virtual hug. It'll be <laughs> fine. Please, please don't. And don't, and whatever you do, do not, do not poke me on Facebook. Whoever still uses poke what on Facebook. What does that mean? I have no idea. What does but that who, mean? Who, whoever still does that, they need to stop. It's like, it's one of the most annoying. I just, anyone who pokes me on Facebook, I, I go, uh, what are you, 12? And I just, I never well, talked to him. here's the deal. <clears throat> here's the deal. I don't know what it means. It doesn't happen that often. And then every now and then I'll get an email from Facebook that says, you know, this is the activity you're getting on Facebook. And I'll go to it and it'll show that I have like 27 pokes that I guess I don't either pay attention to it. Or I don't get the notices, but I don't know what the hell it means. You know, yeah. do you want to poke someone back? Well, you know what? Isn't that against the law? Yeah, exactly. Stop poking me. Do not yeah, poke really. me. Yeah, really. So, again. It's not and, cute. And since we really don't know what it means, uh, I'll let it speak for itself. It's not cute. Um, anyway, uh, hope you had a nice weekend. Um Looking forward to talking to Anthony Hayes uh, to see what's happening in Baltimore. As you know, there's a mayoral election. I believe there are 10 candidates uh, for the mayor of the city of Baltimore. And uh, most assuredly, whoever wins the primary will win the general there. So it'll be interesting to see what he has to say about that. And if anything's improved, and I have a funny feeling uh, we're not going to get a whole lot of positive update on that. Uh, with that said, I don't know about things in uh, Massachusetts, but things here in Michigan, weather-wise, have become amazingly delightful. It'll be 80 degrees today, and I'm not going to talk about the 60 degrees in rain tomorrow. But see, uh, earthquakes in Japan, earthquakes in Ecuador, uh, hundreds of people are dying, hundreds of people are injured. Do yeah, you think we can equate this to global warming? I do. Yes, absolutely. And um, everything else that we're doing uh, to the Earth's core. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, well, you know, I read an interesting article uh, this morning in Mother Jones that the fishing industry in the New England uh, area has been severely affected by the increase in water temperatures that uh, fish are uh, and crabs and lobsters and other things are going to cooler waters, making uh, the industry suffer a great deal. And in fact, between 2004 and 2014, get a load of this statistic, there are 67% less of the species that they farm to sell uh, that are no longer considered sustainable. That's yeah. significant, my friend. 
Well, yeah. I mean, it's a major food source. And in, in New England, it's a major industry. Uh, you know, we have Gloucester, Salem, Marblehead, uh, Rockport, uh, all the way up the coast to and through Maine um, are lobster fishermen. And, um, you know, uh, like I said, it's it's a it's a major it's a major industry. And you compound that with uh, the heroin epidemic because of um, pain medication and prescriptions. Um, there's a rising problem of depression, suicide, drug addiction, unemployment, uh, all kinds of things. I mean, industries that, you know, have sustained communities for decades, if not centuries, uh, are drying up, you know? Indeed. <laughs> and uh, as uh, the headline of this story is... Uh, Something along the lines of the end of the fish stick may be near. Um, you know, Mother Jones has their own unique way of promoting what they do. But um, <clears throat> there's some truth to that, though. I mean, at the, the end of the day, uh, there is some truth to that. So, um, you know, this idea that global warming is only about the air temperature uh, being hotter or being colder, as we've just demonstrated, is not true. It's about the effect it has on our coastal waters. It's about the effect that it has on our glaciers. It's about the effect it has on the Earth's movement, as we're seeing with these tragedies uh, involved uh, with the earthquakes. And You know, Z, if we don't wake up, and wake up soon. And it's not like, you know, President Obama, you'll remember that uh, 60 Minutes interview he did about eight months ago, where he said if there is one piece of his legacy he wanted to leave, it was about environmental change, environmental impact. And uh, unfortunately, he will fall short on that, not because he didn't make an effort, but because the Republican-controlled Congress continues to deny the science and you and I have demonstrated on this program repeatedly that every major science and scientist in this world agrees that global warming is man-made. Well, yeah, and, and also, but, but also, Tony, you know, Sarah Palin was talking over the last couple of days that um, Bill Nye, for example, is no more a scientist than she is. And, you know, I can understand people listening to her and agreeing with her. I can totally see it. I, I completely understand that. I I get why someone would believe Sarah Palin instead of 97% of the scientists in this country. I have nothing more to say. <laughs> Nor do I want you to. Yeah, it, she's it, a real uh, it charmer, makes perfect, but don't, it, don't, you it know. It makes perfect sense to me. Yeah, but see, you keep forgetting she can see Russia from her kitchen window. Um. Yeah, I'm getting, so I'm getting a little, that... I, I'm just, I'm getting a little fed up with, uh, I, I see absolutely no, I mean, if the money, if the reason is money and campaign contributions from the oil industry, I see no reason to, to, aside from that, uh, than to let this just, you know, happen and deny it. Uh, it, it, it baffles me that people are actually capable of either actually denying science as a talking point or even more so denying science because they just don't believe in science. Uh, I, I'm, I forget I'm the third option. There is a third, there is a third way here. And that's the funders like the Koch brothers who continue to pollute at record levels because it's cheaper to pay the fines for not following EPA regulations than it is to retrofit their factories and that really is the problem, by the way. If uh, we <clears throat> raise the fines uh, to a more punitive level, then they would retrofit their factories, but they don't have to. What they uh, do is, of course, they send millions of dollars, and millions upon millions of dollars, to Republicans in the House and the Senate and uh, you know, feed them the line about climate change which they ad nauseum uh, get behind. And it's very disturbing. Yeah. And then you have uh, Jim Einhoff throwing a newspaper, uh, snowball uh, on a the newspaper. floor. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> throwing a snowball on the floor of Congress. Look, no global warming. 
Uh. <laughs> anyway, our guest is with us, so let me uh, introduce him, and we will get this going. Um, obviously, what happened in Baltimore a year ago today is not something that will be easily forgotten, or should it be. And as I said at the time, Z, and I'll say it again, although I don't condone violence, being from the Motor City, where we had major riots in the late 60s, um, and I understand it got out of control, and I understand that violence is not appropriate. Uh, Sometimes it is the only way, uh, historically we know this, to be heard. And in Baltimore, my concern is, Z, they haven't been heard. So let us turn to our guest. Joining us now is actor, author, rinketeer, and bon voyant. I love that. Anthony Hayes. He has appeared in House of Cards, favorite show. Homicide, Life on the Streets, another favorite show. And several community plays. He's a former reporter at the Washington Herald, now a reporter With the Baltimore Post-Examiner, Anthony's poetry, humor, and prose have also been featured in Smile, Han, You're in Baltimore, Magic Octopus Magazine, and I don't even want to know what that's about because it probably involves ingesting stuff, Destination Maryland, Alvarez Fiction, and Tales of Blood and Roses, Anthony Hayes, welcome to the TNZ Talk Show. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm doing fine. How are you doing this morning? Well, I'm all right. Listen, you, you heard my intro, Anthony. I, I don't condone violence, but I understand what happened in Baltimore. And, you know, let me just go to the big question. I mean, the, and the big question here is, a year later, is anything different? Has anything changed? Are we seeing any kind of proactive movement to help the people that have suffered through what has been really not just a racial divide, but an, a socially economic divide? Well, that's the, uh, the probably the billion-dollar question, what's, uh, what's going on. Um, the, uh, there's been a change uh, here in Baltimore in, at the head of the, uh, the police department. Uh, a lot of people feel like the uh, former commissioner was made a scapegoat um, in a situation where the police were obviously told to stand down and, and kind of let the riots play themselves out. And that's what happened until the uh, the governor sent the Maryland National Guard in. Um, but money is being poured into the city. Uh, places have been rebuilt. The uh, the um, CVS that was uh, that was burned basically to the ground uh, has been completely rebuilt and, and reopened. Um, so you know, the life goes on. Um, you know, how, how much more change? Uh, you know, that remains to be seen. Well, you know, Anthony, I, I, I kind of listen to what you're saying and what I'm not. I mean, it's nice that money's flowing in. It's nice that they're rebuilding buildings. What are they doing for the people? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, I, you know, I know that uh, the, the, the church, uh, church community the ministers of all denominations have, have really been out front um, in trying to, to, you know, to rally the community around itself, uh, uh, you know there there are problems here in Baltimore that uh, I'm sure you see in Detroit and uh, other other major major metropolitan areas where you really have uh, two different Americas. You've got uh, you've got the haves and the have-nots, and um, and unfortunately, uh, you know the kind of industry that used to be here in Baltimore with the steel mills, the uh, automobile manufacturing, um, you know paint manufacturing, other things that's all gone. And uh, and you don't have the kind of jobs that 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 these young people can can get into, uh, kind of entry level uh, with with you know minimal education, high school education, and 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 make a decent living. What do they have? You know, they've got uh, they've got life on the streets. That's what they know. That's where they can make their money. That's what they're doing. All right, uh, my co-host Richard Zombeck is also with us today. Z, I'll throw it to you. Yeah. Good morning, Anthony. Um, so, hi. So going going back to to Tony's question is okay. Great. So they're rebuilding, but what what? I mean, I guess the question I have is what kind of rebuilding is going on? Is this you know are these commercial buildings or are they you know uh, YMCA's and community centers and areas like that? Right. Stupid question, probably, but you know. 
No, no, it's a, it's, it's it's a legitimate question. I mean, we we do have a, we do have a good bit of commercial building going on here. Businesses are trying to you know to come back in, into Baltimore. Um, you know, some of the businesses that were burned out have have been reestablished uh, along Monument Street, where uh, where you know the the rioting just went went right down through this this uh, this business district in, in one of the poor areas of town and looted all of these stores. A lot of these stores have come back. Uh, so, you know, so it's encouraging to see that. And yeah, there have been some community centers uh, dedicated. Uh, you know, so, so you know, people, young people have a place to go um, and play, uh, play sports um, and get some after school uh, programs, clubs like that. And, and all of that is encouraging. You know, the, the bigger question uh, that, that Tony brought up is, you know, is, is how, does, how does this carry forward? To rebuild Baltimore, and and I think that, that still remains to be seen. You know, you're not, uh, you know, having a community center where you can play play sports is is great. Uh, you know, does that does that help uh, stabilize the, uh, the the black home? Um, you know, where you know the, the, you've got absent absent fathers and 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 moms on drugs. Uh, you know, what how does that help? But that's that's a good question. Well, you know, in, in, interestingly, as we uh, and I rarely agree with Donald Trump, but on this one, I do that uh, the way to fix some of this, some of this is to provide economic opportunity. I talked about economic uh, uh, equality earlier or social equality or uh, a little earlier. The economics of that is the unemployment rate in Baltimore is absolutely horrendous. Uh, what really disturbs me, and I remember reading this uh, right after the uprising, was that in certain pockets of the city, the average ex- age expectancy before someone dies was 20 years old. 20 years old. Anthony, in no way, shape, or form is that acceptable. My question is, where the hell are our politicians on that question? Yeah, we've got a uh, mayoral race right now. The uh, sitting mayor, Stephanie Rawlings Blake, uh, decided, I think, wisely not to run for re-election. Um, there were a lot of people in Baltimore, uh, uh, in both the black and the white community, that wanted her head uh, because of what they felt was uh, was basically a, a, a you know a feckless response to the initial rioting. Uh, she she was she was nowhere to be found. Uh, like I said, the police commissioner has been replaced. Uh, so you know what's what's happening here is, has been front and center with this uh, with the, the mayoral the, uh, you know, the coming mayoral election. Um, you know, economically, you know, that, that's that's what under uh, under underpins uh, the economics and, and the family structure. The two the two things that really underpin any kind of effective long term change uh, that Baltimore is going to experience. And again, the, I think that's that's across uh, the across uh, the board with with uh, major mer- uh, major urban centers across America. Well, we only have you for a couple more minutes. Uh, Z, I'll let you have the last one. Yeah, I don't really. Um, I'm. Th- I'm I'm always surprised that you know these neighborhoods, these areas. I mean, we look at Flint, we look at Baltimore, we look at Detroit, we look at Michigan. They're they're all. It, it's hard not to say that this is racially unmotivated. To 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 coin a phrase, it's kind of like, well, you know, we'll just we'll leave that area alone. I mean, I don't I don't know what you're seeing there. And the inter- interesting thing about uh, about the racial aspect was um, was one of the the, uh, the buildings that got torched a year ago was a community center that was being built by the uh, southern the Southern Baptist Church at uh, at Chester and Gay Streets. Uh, went over there, looked at this building burned to the ground, got out and walked around the neighborhood and started interviewing people. And this is a neighborhood that I would not normally drive through, and if I did, the windows are up, the, the doors are locked. But I'm out there as a newsman interviewing people, and and you get you get out there and you talk to people, and and you've got a lot of folks that, uh, you know, second, third generation in these homes. Uh, they're they're great people. Um, you know, they 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 work hard when they can get a job, uh, and and they they told me they said we can't sit on our our front stoop without you know gunfire going on. You know, we're we're scared. We want the police in here. We want the police arresting these uh you know, the bad element in society um you know that it's not a racial thing for them it's a good guys versus bad guys and that that's something that i think really needs to be part of the conversation as well uh, you get away from the, the the racial aspect and you've got the the hard working the decent people who are just fed up with you know the drug dealing and the, the general thuggery that goes on 
Yeah, people just actually want a chance, and I think that we often forget that. Anthony, when we've got more time, I know you're on a schedule. We'll have you back and really have an extended conversation on this. I We both appreciate your time uh, this morning, and uh, peace to you, brother. Thank you very much. Thanks, Anthony. You bet. Thank you. <laughs> Devastating, Z. Yeah, it's really it's it's really troubling, and uh, you know, I mean, personally, I don't know what to do. But you know, this is why why we elect uh, government officials to figure this out and to fix these issues. And rather than ignore it or turn away from it or throw money at it, um, I mean, throw money at it is one thing, right? I mean, we we talked a little bit about that, but where is that money going, and why isn't it going into, you know? Uh, Create, creating an environment that, that fosters uh, jobs. And that's easy enough to do. Plenty of other places have done it. Well, and again, I appreciate what Anthony Hayes had to say about money pouring in to rebuild the buildings that were uh, damaged by fire or violence. And, and, and I get that, and I appreciate that. And it should have been done that way. <clears throat> but that doesn't come close to solving the core issues that started this to begin with. And the mayor, by the way, and Anthony was very gracious, not only decided not to run for re-election, made a promise not to run for re-election. And that got her out of a whole lot of kerfuffles uh, because the community was enraged, wanted her head on a platter, uh, for for obvious and I think very fair reasons, and so when she made that pledge not to run for re-election, it did uh, cool off the temperature there in Baltimore a little bit. You know, we have to remind ourselves as well that Baltimore, like a lot of uh, inner cities um, in the, in this in that part of the world, has extreme, extremely hot summers, extremely cold winters. Um, you know, when you have that extreme kind of weather, it, it obviously affects people as well. Um, listen, every year, Z, uh, watching the local news, there's always a handful of cases where a house burned down because they had to heat it with a kerosene lamp or they had to open up uh, their ovens to heat uh, a room in the house and the pilot light goes out and they die from carbon monoxide poisoning. I mean, every year there are a handful of these cases. Uh, guess what color those people are? Yeah, well, I can't imagine. Always. They're always black. <clears throat> always. It never happens to white families. And not that there aren't white families that are poor. I'm not suggesting that, but you know, these are the kind of issues that, you know, rebuilding a right A doesn't solve. Yeah, I mean, I, I I agree, Tony. I hate it when that happens. Um, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> well, and, you know, I, I was I was thinking about this because really, um, you know, you you see a lot of this and I've I've been um, somewhat. Uh, insulated uh, from that level of poverty uh, in in my life. Uh, I've and it's not to say that you know I live in the lap of luxury, but uh, I I don't I don't see a lot of abject poverty uh, where in the places where I've lived. Uh, I just I just don't. I haven't seen entire communities uh, crumble and fall apart and um, become completely destitute. And uh, so, you know, to to know that that's happening in this country, um, I mean, I see the statistics and stuff, but I don't see the real, I don't see the real life of it. Like, you know, you and, and Anthony have that really are probably more affected by this than, than I am. Would well, love to show you. By the way, a, a little breaking news, very sad breaking news, at least in my opinion, Uh, The U.S. has decided to uh, increase the number of soldiers in Iraq. And I don't know how you feel about that, Z, but I find that absolutely devastating. Yeah, that's not uh, that's not good news. No. And uh, a recent uh, just uh, now updated 
350 people have been uh, confirmed killed in the Ecuadorian earthquake, which you and I were talking about at the top of the show. I wish I had some good news to share, uh, but even if I mention the name Trump or Cruz, it isn't any better than troops in Iraq and uh, the dead people in Ecuador, unfortunately. Um, you know, you and I were talking before the show, so let's, let's go there for a minute. Um, the election isn't until November. And you and I have stopped enjoying the circus on both sides of the aisle that has become the presidential election. And in some ways, we're forced to discuss this because we can't ignore it, obviously. But that's, there's a long time to go between now and November. How the hell are we going to survive this? I, I don't know. I mean, I got sober nine years ago, so I don't have a lot of options available to me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, did I say nine months or well, nine years? It, nine years. Okay. Yeah, it was nine years. So yes, they're not, it was. In fact, and, very recently. And and here and here's the thing is that when um, when you have to be in reality twenty four seven with nothing mind or mood altering in your system, it becomes a very different world. And uh, you know, I mean, I I do meditation and I go on walks and I try to breathe, uh, and I've gotten better. I mean, this doesn't bother me as much uh, anymore. I mean, it used to actually give me a reason to live was to wake up and get pissed off enough to want to get through the rest of the day, uh, you know, just by watching the news or what was happening in the financial industry or what was happening with foreclosure or, and, you know, yesterday was the first day that I flipped on the TV to, for my normal Sunday run through of Sunday shows and about 15 minutes in went, you know what, screw it. And um, I actually went out and walked around a little bit and walked around downtown and sat and ate an apple and watched the black squirrel uh, running around and then went to a two-year-old's birthday party and, uh, you know, got my head back. You know, I am um, glad to hear that, by the way. Um, <laughs> going back to our discussion on the impoverished, impoverished and... Um, you know, the, the some of the devastating communities. And, dude, if you were to come to Detroit, I could show you sections of the city that look like third world countries. And I wish I were joking. I've been to Boston a handful of times. Uh, I mean, Boston proper. And I remember the first time I was there, I came back and I was either telling my wife or somebody uh, close to me that what I found striking about Boston was that it was uh, beautifully integrated. There were, even in the, in the older sections of Boston, there were predominantly white folks. And it was it seemingly a very safe place to be. Uh, unlike other uh, major cities, uh, you know, and I'm going to leave Salt Lake City to the side for a moment because you could literally sleep on the streets there and nobody would bother you because uh, they're all in bed by 7.30 at night. Uh, and I wish I were joking. Um, but, you know, with all that said, I, you know, that's the one thing I found striking about Boston. I don't know if it's still that way. And when I the first time I went, it was about three or four years before the big dig was done. Um, and like that's all everybody talked about. They didn't talk about racial divide. They didn't talk about economic injustice. They just kind of uh, talked about the big dig. Yeah, well, and and there are um, there are poorer neighborhoods. Uh, there's there's no doubt about that. Um, there are areas of of extreme poverty um, as well. But here's the thing, Tony, is that Massachusetts is for even though we have a, a Republican governor right now, it's it's a blue state, right? And you know we we offer health care. Um, to in fact, we had Romney care before Obamacare or Hillary care, for that matter, was even an issue. Uh, you know, Romney actually a Republican uh, who denied all ties to socialized medicine and health care uh, actually 
you know, passed uh, universal, well, not universal health care, but affordable health care in Massachusetts. And it was a model for it was a model for Obamacare, for Obamacare. And, you know, in fact, uh, it just celebrated its 10th anniversary last week. And I'll tell you, both my wife and I um, are on the mass health care system. And, you know, we don't pay uh, an exorbitant amount per month. And we have excellent, excellent. And I'm I'm saying excellent health care. Now, it doesn't cover dental, but you you can if you want to pay more, you can. You can pay more, but we have we have very good health care here and um, we have very good programs for food stamps and Medicare and dental and, um, you know, all kinds of things in, in Massachusetts to help to help our citizens. We're not we're by no means the most liberal and caring and um, equitable state in the country. But, um, you know, we're certainly doing better than places like North Carolina, Mississippi, and Louisiana, that's for sure. Well, we're going to get there in a moment. Let me uh, say a few things about what you just said. Number one, uh, outside of Minnesota, which has become just the place to live, uh, Massachusetts has done the best job in the nation at funding K-12 education and higher ed. Uh, They continue to reap the benefits from that. And one of the ways they're reaping benefits is a way that most people don't think about. The citizens of Massachusetts are being educated and staying there after their education is done. I'm not talking about the, uh, you know, the the Tommy Hill figure of schools. I'm talking about, you know, good uh, state schools, good community colleges uh, that are educating the people of Massachusetts in a way that is motivating younger people to stay right where they're at. And that is a bigger stat than people realizing. Um, As we look around the country, Michigan is a great example where we defunded education so that we could give corporations a $1.6 billion tax cut every year for the last five years. That's $1.6 billion a year every year for the last five years. Uh, Governor Rick Snyder of Michigan just recently, the last two budgets, decided to increase the per-pupil spending. But uh, if you factor in inflation, they're not even close to where they were at uh, before he took office. And this is happening in other parts of the country. The American Legislative Exchange Council, or ELEC, has been one of the motivating forces behind that education movement in an effort to privatize public education, Z, because there are billions upon, well, let's be honest, trillions of tax dollars that are available to for-profit charter schools. And in fact, uh, after Katrina, uh, not just uh, New Orleans, but the entire state of Louisiana went to a chartered-based educational system, which has been an uh, utter disaster. But the for-profit charters are making big dollars off of taxpayers' uh, backs. Uh, This is the kind of crap that will keep you up at night. Well, and and here's the interesting thing, too. And I I don't know uh, how this relates to the education and privatizing. But, you know, I saw an article the other day, and I I was trying to find it while you were talking, and and I couldn't. I know I have it saved somewhere. But you look at privatized prisons, right? There, there's actually a privatized prison uh, somewhere in this country that is now suing the state for not providing enough criminals for them to sustain their business. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I know. And then you have then you have these judges that are going to jail. You know, like in Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania. Uh, who was going to jail because he was providing criminals in the form of youth offenders to these private prisons uh, and getting paid for it and getting paid off for sending more and more kids to prison at very young ages. So, you know, I don't know how that translates into the educational system, but I mean, anytime you start privatizing things and putting money before people, 
uh, there's going to be corruption. There's going to be uh, the the people that are involved in this are going to suffer. And that with kids goes to school lunch programs, with goes to lousy teachers, goes to not enough teachers, goes to, you know, equipment, to all of that. Because we've talked about this before. When you run a government like a business, the business's model is to make a financial profit, whereas the government's model is to spend all the money that it gets. It's a very simple concept, and people don't seem to understand this. And they go, well, and they're... And their constant fallback position, Tony, is, you know, oh, you know, government doesn't know what the hell it's doing. We need to have industry do it. So we need to hire CEOs and we need to privatize everything and blah, blah, blah. And this is where well, we end up. Well, come to Michigan for a month. Come to Michigan for a month and see what it's like to have a CEO run the state, which is what Rick Snyder is. Come to Flint, Michigan, and see what happens when you do put uh, profit before people. Go to the city of Detroit where they have a, an emergency manager that runs the school system and find out what happens when 14 principals are going to end up in court, most of them in jail for corruption. Uh, or better yet, uh, read the Detroit Free Press yesterday and look at the home that one of the vendors for the Detroit Public Schools, uh, look at where he was living uh, in a literally in a mansion uh, that was uh, available to him, and the income that he had was available to him because of the corruption in the Detroit public schools under the guise of an emergency manager, which was appointed by a CEO. You want to know what a CEO-run state looks like? Come to Michigan, where they just announced last week they're going to privatize another prison. Come to Michigan uh, for a month and see what happens when you privatize the prison food system only to find out that the employees are sleeping with the inmates, providing them with weapons and drugs, and actually getting involved with gangs inside and outside the prison. You want to know what it's like to have a CEO run your state? Well, welcome to Michigan where it sucks to live right now. Yeah. And this is this is what we're dealing with. And this is what we're de- I mean, look, what, look what happening in uh, in Kansas. You know, I mean, uh, I'm going to lower all the taxes and the the entire state is falling apart, completely falling apart. No, no anyway. Um, yeah, I know. There's there's only so much we can say about this without actually, you know, I'm just going to go into the bathroom right now and, and just jam my head into the toilet and flush it a couple times. Well, in case you couldn't tell, I got a little wound up there, but yeah, I, I it's not the first time it's happened. It's not going to be the last. Someone needs a nap. Listen, Anna, uh, <laughs> uh, no, not at all. Somebody needs a change of lifestyle. And what I mean by that is we need to elect Democrats that understand the implications of a decision and are willing to be open-minded about that decision. With that said, uh, that'll be my transition into a couple pieces of auto audio that we have, which are just great. Last week, you and I entertained Amy Hunter on this program, a transgendered woman who is in charge of the American Civil Liberties Union of Michigan's uh, trans advocacy program. Well, Michigan isn't yet suffering from some of the legislative ass foolery that's going on in this country. But Mississippi Jor is. And um, in fact, uh, was it Funny or Die put together a tourism ad, Z, that is an absolute scream. Yeah. And actually, I did uh, I did an article on it on Liberals Unite. And there's, there's a little unfortunate thing about that that article too, because what I, what I did was I collected, um, three of the, um, of the ads that they did. They, they did one for Mississippi. They did one for North Carolina and they did one for Tennessee. We have the audio for Mississippi. Uh, unfortunately, funny or die doesn't let you, uh, play their videos on other websites. You can integrate the video. So once I integrated the video into the article, if you press play on that article, uh, you have to go to YouTube to watch it for some reason. 
Uh, but oh, it's a click do... of the mouse. If people are going to bitch about that, then they got a lot. Uh, they need a new life. Just click Listen, on the pe- freaking pe- link. Pe- people, people bitch about uh, their Wi-Fi not working when they have access to everything within 10 seconds and they want it in five if their Wi-Fi is a little slow. We've become a very... Nah, 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 um, nah, nah, nah. Well, yeah, I know. It's it's only a matter of time before I go to the bathroom and don't have to wipe anymore. So, you know, this is this is where we are, Tony. Next we have we have high expectations. <laughs> it's called a bidet. Oh, and they've listen, had them for years. Listen to listen to the elite Tony Trippiano. Oh, I have a bidet. Listen, <laughs> one time I don't. Uh, I was in a hotel room the first time I saw one, and I thought, what an odd-looking urinal. Yeah, um, I know. That'll, that'll, that'll tell you how educated I was at the time. Anyway, yeah. with that said, I mean, there's a nice transition uh, going to the bathroom. Uh, let's listen to the funnier die spoof of a Mississippi uh, tourism ad. And here we go. We're Mississippi. We're proud of our southern values, magnolia trees, and hot days. Now, thanks to Governor Bryant, we have an oppressive law to match our oppressive heat. Here you can march to the beat of your own drum, as long as that beat harkens back to 1888. Visit one of our soul food restaurants and swallow your sense of humanity. Toast to being the state with the third highest teen pregnancy rate. Come dance your heart out without the fear of a gay man or lesbian showing you up. Paddle your way through semantics that justify discrimination. Explore nature with your nuclear family while explaining to your kids why being different is bad and why sex is scary. Soak up the fun in our national chain restaurants and stores before they pack up and leave. Walk amongst mansions previously inhabited by slave owners and now inhabited by bigots. Explore our vast collection of books before we burn them all. And fish in the quiet solitude of knowing that you've been left behind by history. Visit Mississippi, where even worse worse than North Carolina. Well, I, I guess, I guess go, go, to, go to Liberals Unite and hear, hear the good audio. <laughs> no, that was what I got from Liberals Unite. So you was can it? blow that one out your ass. Number one. <laughs> number two. Number two. I tried to play that three separate times, and number two was the best out of the three. Wow. Well. Um, so there was nothing I could do about it. You and your message. Um, so get over it now. Sometimes, sometimes audio is impure, and and but it was good enough where we could listen to it and understand it. And since I'm not the one that produced it or posted it, I don't really give a freaking crap. Um, yeah, well. I thought it was a great ad, but thank you for ruining the moment for me. I appreciate <laughs> that, Z. <laughs> like, like I said, See, I think someone. But you I put it on me. I nap. want people. I want this audience to understand that you put this on me, Mister Radio Guy. <laughs> and it had nothing to do with me. So, who's the one that originally posted the story? Uh, good point. Good point. And for those of you listening, I sent uh, Tony a, a text while it was playing that said maybe clip the beginning next time sheesh aren't you the radio guy so you know we have a we have a little thing going here and, yeah i need i think There's i think also i think this i think i need a bidet um there's also this uh, um, uh, imaginary list that i'm supposed to check off every morning is your phone off did you change this did you do that because Mr. are you recording anal, he's not anal retentive he's perfect I am recording, by the way. Um, all right. With that said, Saturday Night no, and Live. The, and because, not... because you're recording because we do a checklist. <laughs> well, now would not be the time to ask me that question when we've got literally 17 minutes, 16 minutes left of the show. So, uh, Mr. Perfect, uh, if you're going to ask me if I'm recording, which now, see, now I'm checking. Yes, I'm recording. Um, anyway, Saturday Night Live uh, decided uh, to do its own little bit on uh, the anti-LGBTQ movement that seems to be sweeping the South and maybe coming to a state near you. With that said, the infamous Kim Davis uh, was the inspiration for this. Well, it's kind of a spoof, right, Z? I mean, kind of? 
Well, yeah, it's a, it's a spoof on. Um, I can't remember the name of those those uh, new documentaries. There, uh, God is dead, or is God dead, or or something like that. And uh, it was kind of kind of a spoof on that, uh, particularly because it's you know I had originally titled the article that I put up in Liberals Unite, um, God is gay, uh, but the editor the editor changed that. Uh, but there's um, there's a company or an organization called. Pure Flix that does a series called God's Not Dead. Uh, what's interesting is that the first movie in the series sold out for four weekends in a row uh, in selected theaters across the country. Uh, and uh, I kind of speculate in the article that probably because the people in those towns actually believe that the people depicted in those movies really do think and talk the way that they're portrayed in that movie. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so there are well, all these, there are all these movies about God's not dead and God's not dead too. And God's not dead yet. And God's not dead in my backyard and God's not buried in the cemetery and blah, blah, blah. I'm making most of that up, but, uh, the God's not dead series. And so this, this particular clip that Saturday Night Live did um, makes fun of that and Kim Davis and the whole thing about uh, gay people forcing uh, non-gay people into doing their bidding. All right. Are you going to play it or are you just going to walk us through every minute of it? Um, we have some time, right? Uh, I'll play it. <laughs> here, it, here it is. All right. Thank you. Thank you, you Richard Zombeck. Okay. Beth was a small town baker without a care. Hi there. I'd like to order a wedding cake. Of course. Where's the lucky bride? He's right here. Until her faith was tested. Now make the cake. They wanted her to spit in the face of God. I said make the cake. I can't do it. From the makers of God on the Run and Angel in Denim, the Kim Davis story. What are you thinking? Gays are the most powerful force in America. A story of liberal elites run wild. You'll be hearing from our Jewish lawyer. My name is Shmuel from the ACLU. You're in a lot of trouble, Beth. What do you people want from me? My clients just need you to say three simple words. God is... Gay. But he's not gay. God is as straight as they come. Then I guess we'll be seeing you in court. This is my fight song. Take back my life song. In the time of persecution. Court is now in session. Gays are trying to force their agenda. They're even teaching it in school. Only she had the courage to say. They say we're bigots, but Christians are the most oppressed group in this country. Maybe. But I'm going to prove once and for all that God is straight. If God is gay, then why aren't there any gay priests? Miss Walsh, you are on thin ice. You know God is gay. Just admit it. No. She needed an ally. Governor, we are the poorest state in the country, second in obesity, third in teen pregnancy. We have to do something. Well, hold that thought. What's wrong, ma'am? I want to deny basic goods and services to gay people. Everybody out. This is the priority now. Last chance, Miss Walsh. Let's hear it. God is... This is my God is a big man for graphic gay sexual content. Yay. Now, I just want to quickly say that I don't believe God is a boob man. And I could cite some examples, but don't really want to embarrass anyone. <laughs> just saying, God did not create every woman equally. Uh, that, that's true. That's that's a, that's actually Tony. That's a that's a very good point. 
Um, so, but that was hilarious and appropriate and disturbing all at the same time. The best part about the show today is we have 11 minutes left and we still haven't talked presidential politics. Yeah, isn't that great? Do we have to? Yeah. <laughs> well, I do want to get to the Chuck Todd audio, uh, but it's long and it'll get us almost uh, to the end of the show without really having to talk very much about presidential politics. And I want to make a point, and don't take this the wrong way. Um, I have become just as disgusted with Bernie's campaign as I am with Hillary's at this point. And I'm talking about the candidates specifically. Bernie, shut the F up already. All right, yes, there's big money in politics. Yes, you've done well without it. Good for you, but you are the exception, not the rule. And just because you don't like the fact that Hillary can raise... $343,000 a person, and you'd never be able to do that. Well, that's something you need to deal with. As far as Donald and Ted and John Kasich, who, by the way, made a complete ass of himself on Friday when he said the best way for a woman to avoid being raped on campus is don't go to a party where they serve alcohol. Well, there's a good piece of advice, see? Yeah, that was great, wasn't it? It's like, it's never the guy's oh. fault, right? I mean, never. Never with these people. It's never the guy's fault. Well, I would tell you what I would tell my daughters, and that's to and that's kind of how he sounds actually now that I think about it. I would say to my daughters oh, that they they just shouldn't go to parties where they're serving alcohol, and that's the best way to avoid getting raped. Um, it was embarrassing at best. At best. It was embarrassing, and I don't know how the hell, he, as I said in my post on fa- uh, on facial, on uh, social media this uh, weekend, uh, and imagine they've allowed him to procreate, um, but I'll let people's minds uh, play games with that. Let's, let's get to the Chuck Todd audio. Do you want to set that up for us? Yeah, uh, real real quick though, I want to go back to Kasich for just a minute because it was like his his uh, completely delusional comment of a, I had housewives coming out to help me. I mean, both of these are both his his binders full of women comments. You know, I mean, th- those are you you know they say oh that's his Waterloo. Uh, those those are definitely his uh, his binders full of women uh, moments. It, it just, it, it's complete. I mean, it, it, it's early 1900s or 19th century even, uh, to make comments like that. So, uh, do I want to set this up for you, for you? Uh, well, um, McCrory, uh, <laughs> that, uh, guy, that would be uh, governor, governor McCrory from North Carolina, right? Governor McCrory from North Carolina who passed, uh, HB two, uh, a.k.a. the bathroom bill, uh, was on Chuck Todd over the weekend uh, on MSNBC. Uh, was it Meet the Press? Um, yes. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Well, yes. you asked me to set, you you asked know, me to set I, it I, up. I thought maybe you couldn't hear me. You asked me to set it up. Me. And uh, Chuck Can Todd. Can you hear me for, now? Can you hear Chuck, me now? Chuck, hello? Hello? Chuck, <laughs> one, of the, one of the reasons I got this clip was because uh, I've got a problem with Chuck Todd, and uh, he finally seemed to have grown a pair uh, during this clip in in that he actually asked follow-up questions and um, went after McCrory a little bit. So uh, let's let's listen to that clip, and, and uh, uh, audience, you can judge for yourself. And the governor of North Carolina joins me now, Governor McCrory. Welcome to the press. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, since you signed the executive order and it was intended to try, I think you were trying to ratchet back uh, some of the controversy here. You still had more companies joining the boycott here. Bloomberg, Capital One, United Airlines, Williams Sonoma. That, that, that's just on Friday. 160 companies have called for its repeal. You still have an NBA commissioner that is not yet committing to keeping the All-Star game in Charlotte. Uh, any estimates that we have of lost revenue so far we have come up with calculated uh conservative calculations 39.7 million uh, 186 million perhaps in revenue and some have, have suggested billions in lost revenue all of this now do you have 
I'm going to, as governor, as I did with mayor, I will always call out government overreach. In this example, the city of Charlotte, where I was mayor for 14 years, did government overreach. And what your pre-clip didn't mention was it was the left that brought about the bathroom bill, not, not the right in the city of Charlotte, like the city of Houston tried to do and was rejected by 61% of the vote. The city of Charlotte passed a bathroom ordinance mandate on every private sector employer in Charlotte, North Carolina, one of the largest 15th, 16th largest cities in the United States of America. And I think that's government overreach. It's not government's business to tell the private sector what their bathroom, locker room, or shower uh, um, practices should be. Not only the private business, but also the YMCA and other nonprofit organizations. And by the way, this is what 29 other states also do not have these types types of uh, but, restroom, know, locker room, and bathroom policy. So I, I thought, you know, you talked about overreach. Okay, you say Charlotte overreached. Right. How did the state of North Carolina, the state government, not overreach in just the same way? You, you mentioned Houston. Voters made that decision. Right. You could make a case. Voters made the decision in Charlotte. Charlotte rejected it, then elected two new members of the city council. This has been a long debate right. in the city right. of Charlotte. This is where they came down. You guys debated for like 10 seconds. I well, mean, actually, don't actually, you regret the, the actually, time of Charlotte's, debate? Actually, Charlotte's vote was a very little debate. They just had a lot of public speakers speaking for and against. No, that but night. But, but, it was, but it this, was has months, this has well, been they, months. This has been months of a quick, debate. Real quick, Charlotte had originally turned it down just like Houston has. And there hasn't been outrage. There wasn't outrage toward Charlotte when they turned it down initially. There wasn't outrage toward Houston, Texas mm -hmm. when they turned it down recently. But I tell you what I've learned through this is we've got to have more dialogue and not threats. You know, I was in Hamlet, North Carolina, a small town that could be in any town in the United States of America. I walked into a, a buffet restaurant, African-American buffet restaurant, and the people just welcomed me with open arms and said, us. I got back in my car and I got a call, call from a, someone in corporate America going, man, you got to change this. We're getting killed. Mm -hmm. And it showed me the disconnect we have between the corporate suite, suites and Main Street on a very complex subject and a very personal subject regarding government policy of all things which didn't exist before this group it's brought a very this thoughtful up. thing for you to say about dialogue where was the dialogue well, in we, this i mean first of all you didn't well, want let me, a special let me tell you, your legislature i didn't want a special, a special session, session but but the legislature to their defense we had an but april dialogue. we had an april 1st deadline in which the charlotte law was coming into effect and they had to pass the law prior but you had to, said you weren't worried about that deadline i wasn't the legislature accorded their lawyers were because they were afraid once it became into effect it would be harder to overturn and we can have the debate a, lo a longer a longer time but again I don't think government should be telling the private sector what their restroom and shower law should be to allow a man into a woman's restroom or a shower facility at a YMCA for example however in government and I'm not going to tell the private sector any manufacturing plan any bank can have their own policies NBC can have their own policy in Charlotte North Carolina or anywhere in North Carolina. But I do believe in our high schools, in our middle schools, in our universities, we should continue to have the tradition that we've been having in this country for years. And we have a women's facility and a men's facility. You know, it's worked out pretty well, and I don't think we need any further government interference. But you, this, uh, as we talked about, this law went further than that. It, it wiped away the city of Charlotte's ability to, to govern, to, to do some things on their own. For instance, they can't even have their own minimum wage now. Why'd you do that? Why'd you sign that? You're a former mayor of Charlotte. Could you accept all these limitations that big state government has put on city and local control? I made a point when I was mayor of Charlotte for 14 years, we dealt with fire and police and airports and... Mm -hmm. We didn't impose new regulations on businesses, and I don't think the government ought to be the HR director for every business, whether it be in Charlotte or whether it be in Greensboro or whether it be in Boone, North Carolina. And this is this is that fine line between how much does government tell the private sector in a regulatory way what to do, and in this case, um, a city which I still proudly call home, I think overstepped. And and you know I've called out my own Republican legislature in the past with magistrates, and and, right. and I said no the Magistrates need to marry uh, after the Supreme Court case. I, I, what the Supreme Court that. said. Yeah. So, so Tony, let me let me just get something in real quick. Um, what happened in Charlotte is that the Charlotte City Council exp expanded <clears throat> expanded uh, non discrimination ordinance to include gender identity and sexual orientation. That in February, uh, the Charlotte City Council uh, adopted a change 
that um, allowed transgender men and women to use the bathroom of the gender with which they identified. Uh, that was supposed to take effect in April. And last month, uh, the state, in complete panic mode, uh, went after this with the expectation of privacy of people when using a restroom. And just real briefly, what that means for anyone who has a daughter, for any father who has a daughter, uh, that now, because of this ruling of, of House Bill 2, that McCrory signed, basically an executive order, um, you send your daughter, your eight-year-old daughter, into a ladies' room, and because of this, a guy could walk out. Um, formerly a female who now identifies as a male, uh, will, uh, or the other way around, will walk out of that bathroom now. Well, um, I don't know any way, other way to say this. I, as you know, I'm extremely offended uh, by Governor McCrory and what they've done, and we're out of time, but what they've done in North Carolina. With all, all that said, uh, to the Republicans and Z, you, you can decide whether or not you want to uh, bleep this out or not. Uh, this isn't a website called Chicks with Dicks. These are real life people that are dealing with real life problems that have spent, for many of them, a lifetime having to live an inauthentic life. Um, to further berate the transgender community, to further put them in a situation where they can be bullied or they can be oppressed is just inhumane, disrespectful, and not godlike in any way, shape, or form. I'll leave it there. Yeah, I completely agree. Let's let's give the information uh, www.tnz.com on the interwebs. Find us, friend us, follow us, support us. Uh, it's all right there. Uh, do what you can to help us out. All right, that's going to do it for us today. We're running behind. We will be back on Wednesday, unfortunately. I have issues that will take me away tomorrow. Uh, but I assure you, Wednesday, uh, we will have results from the primary in New York. And that should be an interesting day to discuss. Uh, with that said, our thanks to everybody at Blog Talk Radio. And as always, Richard Zombeck and I hope that you'll be well. Oh, yeah. Can you feel it? Just over the credits, just riffing now. Words and chords. Not the poetry and the real thing, but not bad for an ad lib. Not good, but... And it's not long enough, so just do a little bit more. And that's nearly done. That's the final credit there. That's the end. <clears throat>